everyone, I'm Jamie Mullaney in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Goucher College, and I'm just going to talk for a minute or so about uh, the work that my seminar, Sex, Selves, and Society, did with the pocket anthropologists this semester. Um, this is the first class to take on integrating the pocket anthropologist, and it's also the first semester that the pocket anthropologist is running at Goucher. Robbie approached me in January to ask if I would consider incorporating this tool into the classroom, and I really had no idea how we were going to go about doing it. So he and Evan from the Department of History and I sat down and had a really intense brainstorming session about some possibilities. So what you're about to see, um, and I haven't seen it because they're still working on it at the time I'm recording this, um, is what the students were able to um, preliminarily conclude about desire. Um, we picked desire knowing that it was amorphous and enormous, um, but in some ways beautifully messy for this type of exploratory work. So as you watch, I hope you um, can think about some of the intriguing possibilities of what this tool can do. Um, but also keep in mind that these students have been working tirelessly, not only throughout the semester collecting data, but they've pieced together what you're about to see in about three nights time during finals week. So uh, I'm really excited and I hope that you're really excited and I hope you enjoy what they found. Instinct, drive, libido. We often think of sex as a natural, primal, inherent, and driving force that resides in our physical bodies. Yet our social environments largely affect how we experience sex and sexuality. In this course, we used theoretical perspectives of social constructionism to examine these various sexual issues. We used these theories throughout various readings, constructed our own class facilitations, various blogs, and of course developed our very own project on desire. The first step of pocket anthropologists was to find our partners abroad. We had an almost equal number of students in the class as abroad, and we paired them in two ways. First, students in the class were paired with a student abroad, with the requirement that they did not study in the same country. Then we paired the pairs. The result was a group of four, all of whom had studied abroad in a different place. This allowed us not only the chance to get more diversity of perspective, but it also established an even stronger connection between Goucher students home and abroad and increased the investment of everyone. India, Czech Republic, Denmark, Costa Rica, Australia, England, Germany, Las Islas Galapagos, Serbia, Amsterdam, Norway, France, Chile, China, Spain, Ghana, Morocco. 
We asked broad students to capture images of desire, products in stores, advertisements, anything that represented a form of desire in their host country. They were then asked to explain those images. The second task for our broad students was to interview a local in their host country. These were the questions they asked. After the students abroad finished the two desire tracks, students in the class replicated the desire tracks here in Baltimore. They then completed some additional exercises that their peers abroad did not. Specifically, each member of the class surveyed three individuals on the top five words that come to mind when they hear the word desire, and also asked one person to visually represent desire on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. Seminar students also wrote two blogs not intended for the pocket anthropologist. However, you'll see some of the relevant data incorporated here as well. In the first blog, students had to explore an aspect of sexuality from another time or place. In the second, they had to observe an instance of public sexuality, strip club, night at the bar, a burlesque exhibit, and write about it. We identified five popular myths about desire and critically analyzed them using our class material. It is a common idea that desire resides in the body. A recent TED Talk outlines how the experience of desire occurs within our physiology and engages our senses. Our sight is attuned to signs of reproductive fitness in potential mates, and our smell is similarly primed to notice pheromones and MHC molecules that indicate a suitable genetic pair. One study showed that the smell of t-shirts worn by ovulating women was more desirable to male participants than t-shirts worn by women who are not ovulating. The prevalence of medical procedures such as gender reassignment surgery and labiaplasty point to a part of desire that is clearly linked to our biology. Desire is based on physical appearance. Bodies that deviate from the ideal body are not desirable. As we learned from our readings, the physicality of desire is emphasized to the extreme through the prevalence of female genital surgery, such as labiaplasty. This procedure represents the practice of designing bodies to fit certain sexual practices, rather than designing sexual practices to fit bodies. This perpetuates the idea of a standard body and forces people to constantly strive to achieve this standard, despite sometimes drastic measures. In our research on desire, we discovered that what is considered normal desire is unambiguously heterosexual, characterized by a consistent, strong desire to the opposite sex. The heterosexual identity needs to be constantly reinforced through society's acceptance and applause of our heterosexual performances and through the opposite sex's attraction to us. Relationships are monogamous and between people of the opposite sexes with unambiguously sexed bodies. Women are viewed as having less sexual autonomy than men, less of a right to pleasure during sex, and sometimes feel the need to defend or justify their identity as sexual actors. We think of desire as something inherent that is beyond our control. The ways in which American parents differ from Dutch parents when approaching teenage sexuality illustrate how we perceive desire as something inevitable and defiant. American parents are more likely to aggressively forbid sexual contact among their children, while Dutch parents are more likely to accept their sexual activity as something that will occur regardless and allow teens of the opposite sex to cohabitate, even sleep over. Both approaches belie an idea of desire as something that cannot successfully be prohibited. Desire needs to be regulated. We have learned that desire is often institutionally regulated. The media specifically dictates and perpetuates what is acceptably perceived as desirable, while religion and family also play large roles in regulating actions of desire. We compared family perceptions of adolescent sex between Dutch and U.S. cultures. Additionally, through our class blog component, we looked into how, throughout history, religion has been constantly stipulating acceptable and unacceptable actions of sex. Here is how our findings complicate these popular understandings. Desire is often molded by what we anticipate the reaction of others to be. For patrons, I found that when one girl got attention, others would start to celebrate her too. The strip clubs I visited highlighted desire as subject to the social context of its setting and driven by our own need to be affirmed, whether in cash or a manufactured sexual experience. On stage, she becomes an intriguing, shiny object, one which you might have not have acknowledged if she was dancing in an empty room or in her clothes or if you simply passed her on the street. Blog 2. Sex in Public Places.
The colors that fall from cool to warm represent the progression of desire. Desire is often born from mundane daily activities that eventually lead to the buildup of something desirable. Drawing exercise, desire. When we asked participants to describe methods of making themselves more or less attractive, their responses included traits outside of physicality. A 21-year-old male said that he puts on cologne to present himself well for dates or proper nights out. A 21-year-old female said she tried to play up her sense of humor or seem funny to be desirable. A 19-year-old female said that she felt desired by a guy she'd been hooking up with when he said she looked the most beautiful while wearing sweatpants and a t-shirt. One respondent stated that intelligence and kindness are two actions she considered more attractive than physical traits. In our investigation of how desire is defined across experiences, we found that it is fluid and changes within different cultural and personal contexts. When discussing the dominant narrative of desire in Western society, researchers Jackson and Scott say, sex is unproblematically defined as heterosexual, and that even when evidence of other forms of desire or practice is discovered, it is ignored. In fact, we found that these other forms flourish outside of our popular script of who, how, and where we should desire. Across cultures, a mosaic of unique definitions of desire can be found within global religions and histories. Reports of people's experience of their non-normate bodies, like the Hedras of India, trans and intersex folk, and people with disabilities also illuminated rich experiences of desire outside the common script. We found that people can and do turn desire on and off in different times and places. Some women feel more desirable when they use makeup to accentuate their faces. In social interactions, people in different sexual fields have developed different methods for signifying their wish to engage or not engage in certain sexual activities. In Newmar's ethnographic research about the SM community, there were specific ways in which participants in the scene chose to engage or not engage in SM play. At a club-sponsored on-campus party, one of our students observed ways in which other students would dance together to signify their consent to dance together or to signify that they weren't interested. Historical regulations on desire have changed. This demonstrates there is no definitively right way to classify or regulate right and wrong desire or sexual practices. Additionally, transgressions from these norms suggest desire cannot be regulated or contained. An example of this is the regulation of sex found in penitential doctrine in the Middle Ages. While some regulations from that time, such as prohibitions on masturbation, incest, and bestiality are still standard, other regulations, like not having sex during daylight hours, on Saturdays, or if naked, are seen as ridiculous today. I've loved writing the posts, and I loved talking to Alan and Nina, who are my uh, pr uh, partners for that uh, Desire project, and I loved interviewing my friend Josh, and uh, I really liked including a picture with everything so you get a little taste of London and reading everybody else's experiences, which are so different. The interview that we had to do um, for the desire. Yeah. It was very interesting because we actually, I actually went up in the library and chose a random person. Oh, cool. And I'm not the type to actually like talk to people and introduce myself because I'm very shy. But I actually, I stood there for like five minutes and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to do it. And it actually, by meeting those people, it kind of actually opened you know, it up for me to meet more people because now when I see those people, they say, hi, Keon, and they actually know me. So right. the pocket anthropologist actually, it really did help. So I really enjoyed doing the pocket anthropologist because it, I really enjoyed looking at the different desire that each country has and how each country views certain things differently, like how in India they view fair skin as something that's beautiful and over here we normally view it as um, something that's non-desirable. So that was really interesting seeing everything that each country had to compare. Yeah. I think the pocket anthropologist was really a great experience to get this tangible cultural context into our classroom and really utilize our classmates that are throughout the entire world and it really brought that goucher essence of international study into our classroom and helped us um, give us a lot of great examples on desirability.